Hello and welcome to Gabbit Media, I'm Grant Abbott and today I'm going to talk about how I made the lumber mill for the game Atlas Empires. So this is a sort of speed art commentary about mobile game asset creation, where I give lots of tips and tricks about making mobile game assets. And you'll see the whole process from start to finish, from low poly modeling right through to painting. You can see lots of these on my playlist, which is in the description, along with other playlists about Atlas Empires and making other game assets. So to start with, you can see that I've brought some uh, items in from other files, so I don't want to have to recreate them. So where I can, I'll reuse files and uh, repeat things. It certainly saves a lot of time and effort, and if I can just adapt these slightly to make them fit this scene, then that's much easier. I do often have to rebake the textures, so um, if I want to change them or edit them in any way, and you can see there I'm making one of the uh, stone pillars into a sort of double instead of a triple. Uh, so I have to think about how I'm going to rebake that or whether I need to and how I'm going to repaint it so it fits in the scene better. It can be very tough with the sort of modular approach, uh, so that's um, using and repeating assets and using uh, the same texture space, but you have to think very carefully about how you place your shadows on the object. Otherwise, when you turn them round, um, let's say you've got one object upright and one object at a 90 degree turned, the shadows aren't going to work. So that modular approach, you really have to think carefully about how you're using those shadows. And I talk a lot about this sort of modular approach and uh, how to texture uh, with that approach. It does save a lot of texture space. So you only need uh, those UVs for, uh, let's say, several objects. You've got, let's say, the logs, for example. Um, if you've got several of those objects in the scene, they're only using one UV space. If you have them all as separate objects, then they will take up a huge amount of UV space. The texture space itself will be reduced to 512 by 512. Still get a lot of questions about that. <laughs> uh, so I'm painting on a 1024 by 1024 texture, just to give me a bit of room when I'm painting so it's not too, too pixelated. And then that will be reduced down to a 512. Uh, and you'll have lots of these 512 tiles on a bigger map uh, so that it reduces the texture calls. And that's where the um, engine or whatever it is has to look at um, for a different texture. And that takes up more processing power than it does to look for one bigger texture. If you do have any questions, specific questions about the um, workflow or what I'm doing, then put them in the comments and I'll try and mention them next time. There's only a few more sets to do, but there's uh, plenty more work uh, in the sort of whole Atlas Empires thing that I'm doing. Uh, so luckily enough, I'm going to get to do some sculpting uh, where there's some cards of each of the characters. So I won't be doing any specific character modeling, but I'll be um, doing the sculpting for the card, so I'm quite excited about that as well. I'm still greatly enjoying the work and uh, it seems to be going very well. The team are very pleased with uh, what's being produced at the moment. And they're looking to release this sort of um, full version uh, at the end of February, hopefully all going well. I'll put some of the examples that they've shown me in the corner now and you can see how these models are looking in the game. It's very exciting, really uh, fantastic to see the models that I've worked on in the actual game uh, working and looking great. I'm really excited to see how the game plays and uh, whether people enjoy it of course. Uh, I'm looking to play the game myself and actually have a go and see it all working. I think the bit I'm most interested in is how they're going to make it work uh, with the sort of environment around you and this sort of Pokemon Go style. It's going to be fascinating. Anyway you can see me modeling uh, different shapes here. This one was a very slightly tricky one so the saw and I was trying to think about how to shape it so that uh, one, it mirrors correctly, and two, it sort of looks like a saw. And uh, it's difficult sometimes to make sharp points on things because uh, when you get uh, or model into a sharp point, it's very hard to texture that area. Um, so it can be a bit awkward um, for the texturing process, but you can see sort of created it and then uh, mirrored it across. Uh, use a lot of mirroring when you're doing low poly game assets. It's not an easy one that, it takes a bit of experience of the painting process as well to understand uh, how and when to mirror and when you can't mirror. So for the most part you're thinking about where the shadows are and generally speaking things that are closer to the ground, so lower down, will have more shadows and things higher up will hit the sun more. Uh, so you're thinking about those sort of lines or along those sort of lines. Uh, so you've got to think about your mirrors that they don't mirror up and down otherwise you've got a very flat looking object. And generally speaking, you're trying to avoid mirrors where possible uh, when you're doing a modular approach because you, you have to be careful of 
the shadows. It's all about the shadows really when you're painting these uh, textures on to create that illusion of depth. And that's what you're always looking out for uh, when you're doing these shapes and trying to fake the shadows in and things. It's quite a tricky process. Things like these log piles or planks of wood piles are quite tough as well. So I'm trying to create the illusion that there's lots there without having to stack up loads of logs because that would make it quite high poly. So you can see I'm just creating the odd notch in here, looking to make sure that it's the right size and the right depth and that each of the planks of wood are going to be the same shape. And you can see there I'm trying to line that up so it's a similar shape to the ones at the top. And then I'm counting how many down to the bottom, adding in these sort of loop cuts uh, and occasionally adding in a little notch to uh, make it work, hopefully. And it does seem to work by the end of the process and I'm quite pleased with how it worked out. Again, you're always thinking about the silhouette and uh, looking around the object, making sure that from different angles it hasn't got a really hard edge down one side or a really straight edge down one side. These are kind of um, extra bits that each level might have. So uh, you'll have different stages of the lumber mill being full or empty or half full. So there's sort of three levels to it. So I'm setting up these logs and planks uh, so they fit into the lumber mill in the different levels and things. Again, I'm using logs that I've uh, used before uh, from different um, sets. Uh, so uh, when I repeat them, um, so you can see that sort of module approach, when you repeat them, uh, you misshape them slightly. So you rotate them really slightly or especially around the Z axis if they're cylindrical uh, to give them that look that they are each different and each individual. It's not that easy because a lot of the time it just looks like it's repeated. It doesn't matter too much and you can get away with it in mobile games uh, because you're looking on such a small screen. So the fact that you've got a limitation of the texture size is sort of made up for the fact that they've got such a small screen to look at it on. So uh, you can get away with an awful lot really. I try as much as possible to make it look uh, as good as possible in, at this size, which is sort of full screen. And if it looks good at this level, then it should look good when it's zoomed out. Of course, the great thing about this modular approach is that once you've done one kind of level, uh, the others are fairly straightforward and you only have to do a few extra things um, each level to sort of complete the model. So in this case, all the sort of mill section is done, so it will be repeated 10 times and that's nice and easy for me. So as a model, it's quite a straightforward process, um, but it does uh, create all these difficulties when you're painting and you're trying to create the illusion of depth. It is sometimes a good idea to uh, do a couple, let's say uh, the stumps, the tree stumps, and you had lots of them. It's sometimes a good idea to do a couple of those uh, so that you've got more variation. But the more you do, the less texture space you have. So it can be pretty tough. So you can see now that I've duplicated that shape I always duplicate it um, with Alt-D, so it's a linked duplicate, uh, and then um, I've got those sets that I can easily change one of them, and all of them will change when they're linked duplicates like that. So that's quite nice, and it helps with the modeling process. I combine them all at the end in the sense that um, I make them just normal duplicates at the end, so they're just sharing a texture space. But when you do a linked duplicate, it does mean that the texture and UV spaces will be copied as well. If you just do a duplicate, then you would have to line up each of the texture spaces. That's why I'm using those link duplicates. So you can see basically as each level goes up, you get a new object. So in this case, a few sort of stone walls uh, and the walls get more complicated. Then a floor comes in. I quite enjoy painting the floor. That was good fun. Uh, it's nice sort of painting a flat texture because you've really got to concentrate on how the light's going to hit it to create that illusion of depth. And it's a nice big area uh, to paint where you don't have to worry too much about it's getting repeated and that sort of thing. But you do have to worry about the shadows that are caused by the other objects because they change each level. You can see that I'm doing the same technique again. So it's a big sort of long plank of wood, but I'm creating those sort of um, extended bits out at the end to make them look like they're individual planks. And then actually I bring some of the poly count uh, in later on. Actually I didn't with this one, but you can. Uh, bring some of them in. It shouldn't make too much difference, but uh, you can reduce it um, by merging some of your vertices and sort of tidying it all up. I might have done it later. Because they're linked duplicates, you can do a bit later and it will change every one before it. 
Some of the items might look a bit weird. You can see the um, sort of double stacked stone pillar, <laughs> if you want to call it that. Uh, it looks a bit weird at the moment because it's been brought in from another program, so a pended file. Uh, and you can see me doing that there with the walls. So I'm taking a chunk of the wall there. But I might adapt it so um, later on when I bake out the textures, um, and so for that double stone wall thing, I, I might bake out the textures and then paint the top separately um, so it's got its own um, sort of matching uh, top to the bottom. It can get very confusing though, that's the only thing, uh, and you're forgetting sometimes that uh, this is linked to the other bit and so forth, uh, and it, it can be frustrating if you've changed something on a linked duplicate and then it changes all your previous ones and you forgot that it was linked duplicate. So you've sort of updated the previous ones. And it's a real shame when you do that because you have to go back and uh, either append the file back in or um, tidy it up and so forth. So uh, it gets very complicated when you've got all these shapes. And you notice that I'm a bit poor when it comes to naming. I'm just naming the groups rather than every single object. I think it just saves a bit of time uh, where I can get away with it because there's an awful lot of objects and labeling them each it just takes absolutely ages so uh, putting them in groups that are labeled um, should make it clear enough but it has caught me out a little bit in the past especially when i'm trying to append files in I end up having to bring the whole group in because i know the name but i'm not sure uh, of which object and so forth so it is a good idea to label them but i'm in a bit of a rush uh, with these things so uh, trying to get them done as quickly as possible so we can meet that february deadline so I've finished the modeling stage there and you can get a rough idea of what it looks like. Obviously it's a bit painted there uh, because I've appended some of the files in, but I've got to do a paint over so they blend in with this scene better. So next is the unwrapping process and going through each of them. But before I do that, I need to give some of these ones an extra UV map. So they'll have the original UV map from the file that they were appended uh, from and the texture they're using from that original file so I can keep that texture on the object and then this new UV map uh, that I'm going to put on so it's part of the lumber mill set. Hopefully that makes sense. It's a fairly complex process and a little bit dull and hard to explain uh, but I can go through it. Uh, lots of people have asked me about going through baking and I probably will uh, in a future video at some point. You can see I'm reducing some of the polys here as well just making sure that it's all tidy and got as fewer faces as possible. I'm not actually triangulating the model, so uh, you can see where there's quite flat faces and their end gons. It doesn't matter too much. They'll be triangulated uh, when you come to render and uh, export as FBX and so forth, and they'll share the UVs. It's not a problem that, as long as it's a flat face, you can get away with lots of end gons. But it's very important to remember for any that you've imported that you need an extra UV map before you start re-unwrapping otherwise it will mess up your whole shape. It's quite easy to see when you're in this sort of render mode because instantly the shape will change as it unwraps and then you think, oh yes, I've made a mistake there. <laughs> Better go back and do the actual um, UV map that should be new. You can see here as well, I'm deleting the whole bottom of this set. So again, uh, there's a fair bit of tidying up whilst I'm doing the unwrapping process. And it's a good point to sort of really look closely at your topology and see whether it's working and uh, what you need to do. So there was a very quick run through of the unwrap and I think I may have missed some of it uh, just because it was a bit dull. Uh, so onto the painting. I haven't shown the baking process. Again, that's uh, extremely dull and it's a bit difficult to explain when it's time lapsed. I need to do a separate video. So again, in the comments below, if you want to see a video about baking. You can see on my map on the left hand side that uh, the objects have all been baked out now. So uh, many of them I don't have to redraw. Um, although I will be redrawing over aspects of them to make sure they fit into this scene correctly. If you want to see more detailed videos about how I paint uh, wood, for example, and other things, I have a whole playlist where there's a link in the description and it goes through the basics of painting and also the different objects uh, in detail. So I break it down without speeding things up and really go into detail about how I'm painting the objects. You can see here that um, I'm trying to lighten bits that are hit by the light and darken bits that are gonna be in crevices. But this is what I'm saying about if you've got a modular approach, you have to be very careful about how you're uh, rotating your logs there. You can see I had to re-rotate them because the shaded bit was at the top. But you can see why I wanted to do that because I wanted 
to give it the illusion of depth because the logs are just sort of plonked on top of each other at the moment, they look very flat and they really need some sort of shadow between the two of them. And there's no ambient occlusion being used. There is going to be one light in the game, but uh, that's all we've got. So you can see that I'm trying to create that illusion uh, within the texture space that I've got. But again, it's a very small texture space. And when you're repeating these objects, you have to worry about where the shadows are. I can't stress that enough. It's quite a headache at times. So you can see that um, with the planks, it works quite well with just those bits jutting out and then you draw all those shadows and crevices in yourself. So with low poly modeling, that's quite important that you understand uh, the silhouette of the shape, so that structure and outline. Uh, and then you can go in and start painting these details on, uh, painting the highlights, painting the shadows. I always start with the shadows because then it's a bit like you're sketching. Uh, so with sketching, you're always painting on shadows. Uh, because you haven't got, uh, the, you use the paper in a sense, the white paper as the highlights. So you should sort of shade everything as it were and then leave the highlights. But it's nice here, we've got a highlight brush. So we go for the mid-tone to start with, and then we add the shadows and then the highlights. And then we just go over with maybe a multiplier screen, darkening the bottom, lightening the top, and you come up with some nice wooden material planks and so forth. In a way, it gets very repetitive doing this process, but I still really enjoy it. I feel like I'm learning every time I paint something and get better every time. I suppose it is a bit of an issue because um, I feel like I need to go back to my original ones because I've learned a few things just in this process. Uh, I suppose it is quite a long time. There's a few months work here, uh, so you can't help but learn and pick up new skills in that time. But that's the great thing about the fact that it's a mobile game. It will be on a small screen, so you don't see so many imperfections. And that's something I learned as well as I was going along. It's taken me much less time to do some of these later ones because I realized the amount of texture I need to do and the amount I can kind of uh, miss out. So the, in terms of the detail level, you can see, for example, this stump here, which I'm sort of redrawing. It's not particularly detailed, but when you zoom out, it looks enough um, on this screen. So on a mobile screen, it's going to be just fine. You can also see the fact that I'm having to sort of redraw over some of these objects to make sure they fit in with this scene. Um, I gave that particular log its own texture space because it was copied from the first one and then I baked that original texture on, then changed it. So hopefully that makes sense about sort of reusing your textures by baking. Sometimes it's quite a long process, the baking process. It's not that simple and it's a bit awkward setting up new maps and all this sort of thing. So sometimes it's just quicker to redraw it so you have to sort of weigh up the time and that kind of comes with experience and um, understanding of the programs. A few people have been asking me why I'm not using things like Substance Painter or other programs, paid for programs and paid for plugins as well um, or add-ons as they're called in Blender. And the reason is I try and keep it as uh, Blender, vanilla Blender as possible, as they might say. One for the sake of not trying to learn any new add-ons and I'm quite comfortable with the power the program is. And two, for the sake of people who are watching who don't want to pay for plugins as well. And lastly, because I've kind of gotten used to this sort of workflow. So um, I don't worry too much about painting in layers because they're quite simplistic objects and it doesn't really demand that need for layers. If I need to do layers, you can do that in Blender. It's just a little bit more complicated by the sound of things uh, as opposed to something like Substance Painter. And also I don't uh, really want to use um, made up textures by someone else. Um, I want to use my own hand painted and stylized uh, textures. And there's a bit of a temptation when you've got this huge library of textures uh, on something like Substance Painter to just sort of use the program to do the hard work. Uh, I don't know that it speeds things up that much. Uh, it probably does, but then um, you would lose some of that um, style that um, I want to give it uh, and it becomes a bit generic. I mean, I appreciate everything that Substance Painter does and I certainly know that it can do some amazing things and speed up people's workflows and so forth. But for what I'm doing, I think it makes sense for me to uh, stick with that sort of uh, one layer approach. And it's a nice simplistic approach. And I feel like my style is then coming out and hopefully that's uh, the demands of uh, the team and the game. They want that sort of style and they want that sort of look. So that's great. Also, occasionally when I'm using tools that are kind of doing things for me, I feel like I'm not really developing as an artist and uh, you end up just 
relying on those tools a bit too much. It's just something I'm a bit wary of because I feel like uh, those sort of processes are going to end up being taken over by uh, computers eventually and it's going to be more about artistic skill and uh, stylization that's going to be more important uh, and that will have more uh, longevity when it comes to a career and things. Uh, but I, I also do think it, it looks just that little bit more interesting and different when you haven't used um, these sort of plug-in textures as it were and all these available textures. It feels like a tiny rant against uh, Substance Painter is not meant to be at all because it is a fantastic program and uh, it does some wonderful things. Uh, but uh, hopefully you get my point about uh, trying to get my own style across. That's the main thing for me. So you can s kind of see that I'm getting through these um, models fairly quickly now. So um, I've got the idea now about how much detail to put in. Uh, so I'm able to go through them at a, a, a reasonable speed. And that does take a little while to think about um, because I haven't done games for mobile before, uh, just sort of general engines and things. So it's been a bit tougher uh, thinking about how much detail level I need to go to. And so if you were to compare this model to some of my previous ones, you'd probably see a lot more detail on some of the wooden planks and things, but it, it really wasn't necessary for the size of the model and uh, so forth on the screen. So It's nice painting big blocks like this for some reason. I think it's because I don't have to worry about the modular approach and I can uh, use uh, shading as I want to without having to think about whether it's going to be repeated and so forth. Uh, what I'm not able to do, of course, is to put in the shading of the the walls, for example, because the walls change as the levels go up, so that was a bit more awkward. I had fun with this one too, sort of painting a tiled rock floor, um, that was quite fun. Always start off by blocking in the colour, blobbing in loads of different colours and spattering different colours on, as if they're different um, shades in the floor and the reflections you get off different items. I've isolated the shape so I can see it easily and then obviously it's mirrored across one side so I have to be careful in the middle there you can see the mirror but obviously when the other items go on top of this you don't notice it so much but you can see I'm just drawing in the shade and then comes the highlights and it works quite nicely really just then put in the highlights and this is quite a quick approach really and then just the occasional highlight across the shape um, as if it's catching the light somewhere and then just deepening that shade in places where I need it. And then varying the colors of the bricks. Uh, I quite like that with the color brush or the screen brush, darkening a few bricks, lightening a few others, and then uh, using the color brush uh, to give it some individuality with the bricks sometimes. I do like that color brush. Uh, it's, uh, it's so easy then to change a the color of something without changing all its shading. So here, painting the chain, this is always a tough one. Metal's always really tough, especially when you're doing a modular approach because, again, it's those highlights and the shading. And metal has a lot of reflections, uh, so it's not going to look right when they're repeated across the whole uh, model. So you have to sort of be really careful. You can't really have too shiny a metal when you're doing a modular approach because you would just see the reflections. And you can see I was doing a little bit of character work there, like a little dent in the top, but I decided against that because again it's the repetition that will be shown up and it will be obvious that it's being repeated. And you can see there's a little glitch in uh, the painting process there and there's a couple of overlapping UVs so in fact overlapping on the shape so I just had to sort that out so if you ever get any sort of glitches it's often overlapping UVs that are the problem. Someone was asking me about that on YouTube the other day in fact. So uh, again with this sort of mirrored object I can mirror it side to side but I can't mirror it up and down because the bottom bit is much darker, especially with this metal. The top will be reflecting the sunlight and the bottom won't. Uh, so you can see the idea there. And the same with the side-by-side -side ones. They had to be different models, um, although they had the same glitch in them because I, I just copied them. But you can see that uh, that has to be mirrored in a different way, so it's not up and down, so it's still side to side. Um, but you then can shade the bottom, uh, lighten the top, and it mirrors across to the other side. Hopefully that makes sense. It's, it's a tough one to get across, uh, that sort of point of view. These spikes are actually a little bit awkward. It's surprising how awkward they were. And they look way too big here, so I had to sort of uh, squish them down in the end. You can also see how I've made a slight error in the uh, stone wall. I've actually copied the texture by accident uh, from the base of my sort of lumber mill uh, section, the actual saw. 
that's got some stone in there and I've repeated it across the walls as well, uh, which I need to sort out in a bit. So just adding a bit of detail to uh, the floor at the moment, making sure it looks nice and uh, deep. And so now I think I come back to, yes, these uh, pillars. So I had to re-unwrap them because uh, they were linked duplicates. So I cut them apart from that link. So I severed the link and uh, used spaces in my UV map. So I'm sort of repainting them now so they look like the other pillars. So you can see the um, modular approach kind of failing a bit there uh, because I'd uh, used that module too many times uh, in too many different places. So I had to sort of recreate it. And that's why it's kind of important for me to have uh, a bit of blank space on my texture areas. I know that's kind of not good practice really because you're wasting space, uh, especially in a game uh, like this where space is really important. But if I didn't have that, it would be very, very awkward and I'd need to rebake things. So I leave um, those big gaps that you get when you unwrap uh, with the basic blender unwrap rather than using add-ons that pack it in really tightly, which are really great but I do need that extra space just in case I need to uh, use a bit for another object somewhere along the line. Matching up the colors can sometimes be slightly tricky, but you can use the color picker. So I'm using that all the time to sort of grab colors from different locations and putting them onto other bits and so forth. So they all match in with each other. And obviously I'm co copying the color palette from uh, previous um, versions. So we're pending in that color palette uh, so that I know which colors I've already used in other sets. So hopefully they'll match up reasonably well. And you can see here that I'm sort of painting in and adapting these shapes that I've grabbed from other versions just so they um, slot in nicely and work for this new model. What we possibly could have done, and it would have been very complicated to do, was to uh, repeat um, lots of different um, materials and objects in different sets. Uh, and that kind of uh, could have been done to a degree, uh, but it was so complicated to uh, use these different materials for different objects and then to sort of link them up into one bigger material in the end. It's just uh, too much uh, organization uh, and it would actually slow things down in the end. So uh, rebaking out and adapting that shape slightly or that texture slightly is probably the better way. So from here on in, it's just sort of tidying up those different pieces. So I've left most of that out because it's much the same. And you can see the final piece there. It's got a bit of contrast added here, so it probably looks a little bit too um, highlighted, but perhaps a tiny bit of adaptation needed there to make them slot in with the other models from other sets. Do let me know if you've got any comments or thoughts or questions or things that you want me to add in later series. Hope you're still enjoying it. Thanks for watching and I will see you next time.